Hello, I'm Lee Pace from Plano, Texas. I'm the fellowship director at the Andrews Institute there, and I am also a founding member and the current steering committee chairman for the Mercury Study Group, which has a focus on meniscus preservation as well as meniscus transplantation. What we're gonna do today is we're gonna take a little trip down memory lane and talk about all soft tissue meniscus allograft transplantation, where we started, where we are, and where we hope to go. So meniscus allograft transplantation as a general technique dates back to the 1980s. It is now an accepted procedure for symptomatic meniscal deficiency. There's been an evolution of techniques since the beginning of this procedure. It first started off as a rather invasive open technique that has progressed down to an arthroscopic assisted technique to now all arthroscopic for most situations. Further, our root fixation, which is a critical part of the procedure, has also evolved. We have now slot and dovetail techniques available. We have transtibial bone plugs, as well as all soft tissue transtibial fixation techniques. Now, soft tissue meniscus allograft transplantation has become popular because it is technically easy. However, there is a concern that there is an increased risk of extrusion, which could potentially affect the long-term results of meniscus transplantation. So the question is, is, does a soft tissue meniscus allograft extrude more? And are there ways we can not have it extrude and have it be comparable to other techniques? So what does the literature tell us about soft tissue versus bone plug meniscal allograft root fixation? So this study published recently in the American Journal of Sports Medicine looked at two groups. 33 all soft tissue meniscus allograft transplantations and 55 meniscus allografts with bone plugs. And that was a mix of medial and lateral. Uh, they all had a similar transtibial tunnel with a six millimeter socket at the roots. All sutures, whether bone plug or soft tissue, were tied over a anterior tibial bone bridge. They all had MRI evaluation at an average of about 40 months with a range of about 36 to 48 months. So this is about a medium term follow-up study, short to medium term. As you can see from table two and table three of this study, there was significantly more extrusion present in the all soft tissue meniscus allograft group compared to the bone plugs. Further, they found a higher rate of graft tears in the soft tissue meniscus allograft group versus the bone plug group. However, based on what is likely low numbers, this did not yet reach statistical significance. It was likely underpowered. The lysome scores were similar between both groups with relation to extrusion at final follow-up. Again, unclear if that is underpowered or what that is due to. On the contrary, some of these larger studies, a meta-analysis and two systematic reviews, were not able to find any differences with regards to extrusion or clinical outcomes when it comes to soft tissue meniscus allograft transplantation versus bone plug root fixation. So it's unclear. We had one study very focused on the comparison between those two techniques, larger pooled studies, which should be powered better, unable to find a difference. So I would say still somewhat unclear as to what the long-term durability is of a soft tissue meniscus transplantation. However, a recent study published just last year in the American Journal of Sports Medicine shows the importance of extrusion on a meniscus transplant. So this study at long-term follow-up, 10 to 14 years, evaluated 21 meniscus allograft transplants split between medial and lateral versus a control group of a meniscectomized patient population. They obtained x-rays and MRIs at five years and at final follow-up. What they found was that there was significantly less joint space narrowing in the meniscus transplant group compared to the meniscectomy group. Further, the advancement of the kelgren lawrence grade was less increased in the meniscus transplant group compared to the control group. And there was a trend to significance with less chondral degeneration on T2 mapping MRI for the meniscus transplant group compared to the meniscectomy group. When you then looked at extrusion, so we took all the meniscus transplants and then said, were they extruded, which as defined by three millimeters or more of extrusion laterally or medially versus those that were not extruded, that's where the significant difference was found. A well-positioned meniscus transplant, medial or lateral, acted similar to a native meniscus, whereas an extruded meniscus transplant behaved similar to a meniscectomy. So this is the first evidence that we have that says that a well-positioned meniscus transplant does protect the cartilage, one, and two, we don't want extrusion because then the meniscus transplant is not functioning the way we would like it to. Let's take a look at how have we done our meniscus transplant techniques throughout history. Almost all published clinical series have a very basic fixation technique, transtibial tunnels where the sutures are tied over a bony bridge. So this is how I started doing mine. I have evolved since then. But if you look at this, that is a long working length. 
And those sutures have the ability to bounce. It can allow creep of the meniscus transplant. So maybe we can do better than this. The recent advances that we've made include tying over independent cortical buttons. And for me, to this point, swivel locks. More secure fixation, still a long working length, but really solid, knotless fixation to hold those roots in place. So the next advance forward is the suture lock anchor. And this is uniquely advantageous to a soft tissue meniscus transplant. The bunching mechanism of the suture lock anchor is directly below the cortical layer of the proximal tibia. So it eliminates the working length of suture and it works to keep the root directly on the tibial surface. So there's no bounce or any creep that can occur with such a very, very small working length of suture. And this is not gonna be usable for a bone plug meniscus transplant because you have to have that cortical layer of bone there for the suture lock to work. So this is uniquely advantageous to a soft tissue meniscus transplant. And you can see from these pictures here that the suture lock anchor, it functions similar to other knotless tensionable technology. The instrumentation is simple, a scorpion needle, the suture lock anchor itself, a passport, a guide pin, a cannulated drill, and a suture lasso wire. You'd start off with your root guide, place the guide pin, drill a 2.4 millimeter transtibial tunnel, pass the suture lasso wire through that, and then use the wire to bring the suture lock anchor down into the tibial tunnel. And from there, you then pull on the sutures at the distal end of the suture lock to deploy the bunching mechanism, which then anchors the suture lock under the subcortical bone of the tibia. And from there, it's just standard suture passage for root fixation. Pass the repair stitch through the meniscus root and then convert and you repeat that step one more time. And now you have two passes through a knotless, tensionable root fixation with the point of fixation, you can see just the thickness of the cortical bone there. So the working length is almost zero. So in conclusion, chondral protection is dependent on meniscus transplant position. While root fixation is one piece of that puzzle, it is crucial. A soft tissue meniscus transplant is a very attractive option because it is easy. However, now it may be preferable given our technological advancement with the suture lock anchor. Thank you very much.